Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this next session at NTW22, Evidence, Discussion and Recruitment in Trials, Investigating the Role of Graduated Compression Stockings. This afternoon, this will cover, cover the GAPS trial, PETS trial and CHAPS trial, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask questions and also to see how you can become involved in, in the latter trial. To submit your questions, please look at your toolbar and use the Q&A tool that is in that toolbar. If you just type in your questions, we'll come to them after presentations and do our best to answer as many as possible. And your comments as well as questions are really appreciated to bring this to life, so please do join in. This afternoon, I'm really pleased to be joined by three representatives from these trials. Rebecca Lawton, who is a clinical trial manager for the IHR funded study, Compression Hosiery to Avoid the Post-Thrombotic Syndrome, which is CHAPS. She has previously managed the NH, sorry, NIHR graduated compression as an adjutant to pharmacoprophylaxis in surgery, which is the GAPS trial, and has experience in running longitudinal cohort studies, case control studies, as well as clinical trials of medical devices and investigational medical products. Along with her is Sarah Perbax, who is the trial manager for the PETS trial, another NIHR HTA multi-center cluster RCT evaluating trial, looking at the role of graduated compression stockings for the prevention of VTE in patients who undergo short stay surgery and who are assessed at being at low risk of developing VTE. Sarah is based at Imperial College London and has worked in clinical research for over 10 years on a number of different projects from large scale RCTs to cohort observation studies. And with them is Matthew Matchin, who is an academic clinical fellow in vascular surgery and is undertaking a higher research at Imperial College London degree, investigating the treatment of chronic venous disease secondary to proximal venous obstruction. So without any more ado, let me pass over to the first presenter, Rebecca Launton. Rebecca, thank you. Thank you, Jo. Just bear with me while I... So can I just check that you can see the screen? Yes, I can. Yep. I just Great, can okay. So yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will be here to present the graduated compression as an adjunct to pharmacoprophylaxis in surgery trial, which was a trial um, that closed in 2019. It was an NIHR HTA um, programme sponsored by Imperial College London. Hospitalised patients were at increased risk of VTE and hosp hospital acquired thrombosis occurring up to 90 days after hospitalisation accounts for two thirds of all VTE and it's a leading cause of preventable death leading to significant health burdens and societal costs. Um, next slide please. So the National VTE Prevention Programme um, aimed to improve outcomes for patients who develop VTE in hospital. And it has a long um, history and development from the 2005 Select Committee report highlighting the 25,000 preventable deaths from VTE each year. And this figure is just from England alone. Um, the prompt publication of the NICE guidelines in 2007 recommended proper risk assessment for all surgical patients. Um, 2008 saw the development of the VT exemplar centres and the national rollout of the strategy, which focused on education, audit and quality control. Um, subsequent NICE guidelines were updated for all hospital patients and um, most importantly, the development of the Department of Health risk assessment tool, which provided guidelines to clinicians. Um, national data collection on all patients diagnosed with HAT and those risk assessed was linked to, linked to sequin indicators um, and mandatory reporting. Uh, next slide. So all patients, both medical and surgical, should be properly VTE risk assessed. And there are many different types of risk assessment tools. The GAPS trial used the Department of Health risk assessment tool um, and also introduced the American Caprini score as a comparison. Um, next slide, please. So at the time of the trial, um, the 2007 NICE recommendations were that all surgical patients at risk of VTE should be offered both um, graduated compression stockings and chemothromboprophylaxis. Um, these recommendations have subsequently up, been updated for different specific types of surgical inf interventions. Um, next slide, please. You might have to press again. Thank you. 
Um, so gaps came about due to a poor evidence base for the use of stockings in this patient population. And gaps asked, what is the adju adjuvant benefit of using stockings in a population who receive adequate chemothromboprophylaxis? Next slide, please. Um, the question needed to be addressed as uh, in the NHS currently, roughly £63.1 million per year is spent in England alone um, administering TED stockings to surgical patients. Patients often complain of discomfort when wearing them and if they're poorly fitted, then they can lead to pain, bruising and non-compliance. Um, there's also often poor education around how long patients need to wear them um, and whether they should be worn after discharge and how long for. Next slide. So the GAPS um, study aim was to determine whether low dose, low molecular weight heparin alone is non-inferior to standard of care, um, the graduated compression stockings plus the low dose, low molecular weight heparin for the prevention of VTE in adult elective surgical inpatients assessed as being at moderate or high risk for VTE. Next slide. So patients were randomised one-to-one to, -one to either the um, low molecular weight heparin alone, so the intervention arm, or the standard of care arm, so the addition of the compression stocking. Next slide. Um, so the inclusion criteria, um, elective surgical inpatients assessed as being at moderate or high risk of VTE uh, were invited to join the study, those who were able to give informed consent and those who were aged 18 or over. Exclusion criteria were anyone contraindicated to um, thromboprophylaxis or to stockings, anyone with a thrombophilia or thrombogenic disorder, any individuals requiring therapeutic anticoagulation, any previous VTE, um, use of um, intermittent pneumatic compression beyond theatre and recovery, uh, patients with a IVC filter, pregnancy or any patients requiring any extended thromboprophylaxis um, and also the application of a cast or brace in theatre. Next slide. So the primary endpoint of GAPS was a combination of imaging confirmed asymptomatic and symptomatic lower limb DVT and or symptomatic pulmonary embolism within 90 days of surgery. We had a number of secondary endpoints including quality of life as measured by the EQ5D, compliance with stockings and low molecular weight heparin, um, any stocking related complications, bleeding complications, um, adverse reactions to anticoagulation and all cause mortality was recorded. Next slide. Um, so the statistical analysis, um, the primary endpoint included VT within 90 days of surgery, and there was a logistical re regression which was adjusted for gender and centre. The secondary endpoints, including the EQ5D, um, were repeated measures using mixed effects models adjusting for baseline score, VT risk, gender and centre. Next slide. So we had seven UK trial centres in total. The list um, is here and the, and the PIs. Um, next slide. And in total, 1,905 participants were randomised into the trial um, and were recruited between May 2016 and January 2019. Um, there were a number of changes that had to happen to the study. Um, we did get a much lower than anticipated event rate in the trial, um, which meant that the data monitoring committee were unable to analyse data at pre-specified time points in the group sequential design. Um, there was a blinded analysis performed by the senior study statistician, um, and it was recommended to continue um, recruiting to the trial. But from then on, we only recruited patients in the highest risk category. Thank you. Um, so you can see, although it's might maybe a bit difficult to see, the consort diagram um, uh, highlighted at the top the number of patients randomised and which arm they were randomised to. Um, and the main take home message is that we had a 16% recruitment from between screening and recruitment and 98% follow up. Um, we had 17 post randomization exclusions. Um, in total, 1,800. 58 patients received surgery. Um, yeah, I think that's all on that slide. Next slide, please. So 
So I'll just go on to summarise some of the baseline characteristics for the trial on the next slide. Um, so baseline char characteristics were similar in both groups um, and further tables are shown in the full HTA monograph report um, that shows balance across the four subpopulations. Um, so in the end, 1,286 were classified as the highest risk according to the Caprini score. Next slide. Um, so a proportion of patients, as I said, what did not have surgery um, after randomization um, for various various reasons uh, listed here. Um, but the main point is that this was balanced across both arms of the trial. Um, so the treat of those who received surgery, around 80% in each group were treated according to their randomized group. So there were some crossover issues um, with non-risk receipt of the prescribed treatment. Um, obviously, some patients in, who were randomised to get the anticoagulation alone ended up with stockings and vice versa. Next slide, please. Um, so we did look in detail at why um, anticoagulation wasn't given. Um, mostly these were reasons with patients discharged early off in the wards. Um, uh, patients were given their dose at around 6 p.m. So if a patient was um, discharged much quicker than expected, then they might miss getting their dose. But again, there was no difference between the groups. So the main results, um, which you can see on the next slide, um, in the intention to treat and the per protocol analysis. Um, so in the pre-specified intention to treat analysis, VTE occurred in 16 out of the 937 patients. So 1.7% of participants in the low molecular weight heparin alone group compared to 1.4% in the combination group. Um, and overall, this shows that uh, as the 95% confidence interval did not cross the non-inferiority margin of 3.5%, the group randomised to low molecular weight heparin alone was demonstrated to be non-inferior to the combination group. Next slide. So in the pre-specified intention to treat analysis, VT occurred in 1.7% of participants in the low molecular weight heparin alone group compared to 1.4% in the combined group. So there was a low incidence of VTE post-surgery, much lower than we were expecting in this patient population. Next slide. Um, so as part of the analysis, patients were stratified um, by age. So those under 65 years and those above 65 years and also against their VTE category. So moderate and high risk. And we came out with four um, subpopulations, which you can see here and the number in, in each population is, um, is shown in the table. So the statisticians basically recalculated the sample sizes for, for the four strata stratifying by age and VTE risk and ultimately abandoning the group sequential design. So for the four subpopulations, similar analyses were performed um, unless there was a zero event rate in each arm, in which case a one-sided absolute uh, confidence interval was reported. So all in all, 84.1% uh, were assessed as high, um, high VTE risk by the Department of Health VTE risk assessment tool. And on the next slide, you can see uh, broken down by the Caprini score. So in the post hoc analysis using the Caprini score in, in place of the Department of Health risk assessment tool, um, 68 0.1% of participants were classified as highest risk of VT scores. So that was more than five on that risk assessment tool. Um, and you can see the P number for the non-inferiority. So next slide, please. So some of the secondary outcomes on compliance. So compliance with um, stockings was overall defined as good if participants were wore stockings for at least 75% of their hospital admission. Um, but due to the low number of events, no formal analyses were planned for any uh, stocking related complications or adverse reactions related to bleeding complications or overall mortality. 
um, a total of 79.8% of participants randomised to the combination group um, had good compliance and full compliance was achieved in 82% in the low molecular weight heparin alone group. Next slide, please. So this table just shows adverse events and overall mortality presented by treatment group. Um, so overall adverse events were low, 6.4% in the combined group had um, adverse events associated with the stockings and the majority of these being for discomfort. And um, so next slide, please. Um, so just to sum up um, the conclusions of the GRAPS trial and present some of the limitations. Can you just show the next slide? Um, so some of our, limitation, our main limitations, so 13% of participants in the study did not receive a duplex ultrasound scan, which could have further detected asymptomatic DVT. However, this was equal amongst both study arms. Um, the study did not include patients deemed to require extended VT prophylaxis beyond discharge. So again, this is an important group of patients to look at in the future. Um, next slide, please. So GAPS was the first large RCT to demonstrate that low molecular weight heparin alone is non-inferior to a combination of low molecular weight heparin and graduated compression stockings in elective surgical inpatients. Um, Non-inferiority was shown across individual risk subpopulations. Next slide. So the overall implications for this trial um, are that low molecular weight heparin alone is non-inferior to the combination. Um, and at the, and in, when we published the study results, we recommended urgent revision of the national and international VT prevention guidelines, um, but also the need for further studies to evaluate whether um, stockings have a role in patients receiving extended thromboprophylaxis after elective surgery or patients on, undergoing emergency surgical procedures. And that is the end of the talk. Thank you. Would you like to take any questions now or would you like to go on to your next talk? Should we take questions? Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. okay, we have a couple that's come through about should AES be offered to maternity inpatients? So was that anything that came up in the study or was considered? Um, so we excluded pregnant women from this study. So we can't say from, from uh, the trial perspective. Um, but yeah, it's certainly a group that would should be looked into. But I'm not a clinician, so I wouldn't like to say from a clinical perspective. And how now are the guidelines changed as a result of the GAPS trial? Yeah, so I'm not sure that they have they have been changed or updated as yet. Um, so it's definitely something that we're still interested in disseminating um, the study and hopefully getting it in front of people who, um, you know, can change can change guidelines. Um, at a hospital level, I still think it's quite variable. Some trusts do. Um, provide stockings and some don't um, and that was the case in the in the trial as well so um, but I'm not sure if how much GAPS has um, changed the implementation as yet we did publish another paper so there was another paper kind of trying to assess um, whether hospital change, hospitals had changed their practice or their policies um, but we're still looking at some of the the data to come out of that. Okay. Were all, a, a, a question from one of the audience, were all your patients given the same dose of low molecular weight heparin or were there patients perhaps of extremes of body weight, both lighter and heavier, who were on a smaller or bigger dose for BT? Yeah, okay. so it was a it was a pragmatic trial. So we left that up to the um, up to the treating clinician um, and we didn't specifically record dose. Um, we just recorded uh, duration as far as I can remember. Um, so yeah, it was very much pragmatic, whatever was done locally, um, to obviously make the study more generalizable across the UK. And there are certainly some centres now who are moving towards not using compression stockings at all, aren't there, because of the evidence that have come out of your trials, so um, things are progressing. Yeah, yeah, I mean obviously it represents a, a massive cost saving to the NHS and time and effort for the nurses and the patients, you know, in our experience don't particularly um love wearing them it just 
it depends when they you know turn up at hospital what they kind of expect as to whether they um want the stockings or not and that definitely was the case when recruiting patients to the trial and it was interesting in your slides about how many complained of um discomfort as well so there was a, quite an impact on a number of those patients about it yeah as well as checking if they're well fitted okay yes. i think we've covered all the questions so shall i start sharing for the next slide set um do you want to go on to the yeah sounds on? good yeah. um so i was going to say too I, i've just seen the questions on the on the chat about um maternity patients and i think um the, the NICE guidelines are quite um, ambiguous around um, providing um, compression stockings in general. And um, so if you, if, you, if you study the risk assessment form on uh, point three, uh, any tick that says warrants consideration of thromboprophylaxis, which encompasses in, uh, compression stockings or pharmacological prophylaxis. Um, and one of the ticks is pregnancy. So although they're not directly recommended by NICE, um, if they're open to interpretation that you could definitely say that that was a, a recommendation. So I'm not sure it completely contradicts, uh, contradicts the ARCO guidelines, but they're definitely not as, as clear, that, that's for sure, um, just as an add-on to that. Thank you. I th yeah, I think there's a lot of evidence still needed, isn't there? Equally, somebody actually is coming with another question to ask if there's any evidence around IPC or how this fitted into your trial at all? There was a big Cochrane review on intermittent pneumatic compression um, that provided more compelling evidence. Um, and I, I think Rebecca, you might be able to add to this, but I think they were excluded from the trial, weren't they, if they were, had intermittent pneumatic compression? Yeah, they were Yeah, they were allowed to use it um, just, in, just up to recovery, but not beyond that. Um, but yeah, I think the evidence base is, is slightly better for IPC, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, I think there's a previous Cochrane um, uh, evidence that suggests that there's reasonable benefit there. Uh, I can't remember which year it was, unfortunately. And I know some of the large centres who are stopping the compression stockings are moving much um, over to using IPC far more um, frequently because they're not using the compression. Okay, shall I share then? And uh, right, just one second while I get this going. Over to you. Uh, so I think we were doing pets next, but absolutely fine, Rebecca, if you want to carry forward with chaps. I can stop. That's OK. I'm happy to go on to chaps. So, yes, thank you again for the opportunity to present. So chaps um, is the compression hosiery to avoid the post thrombotic syndrome trial um, funded again by the NIHR and sponsored by Imperial College London and supported by Thrombosis UK. Um, so next slide please. Just a bit of background um, to, uh, to chaps. Um, so around 50% of patients with acute proximal DVT um, will go on to develop symptoms of the post thrombotic syndrome. So the aim of CHAPS is to evaluate the effectiveness of graduated compression stockings in preventing PTS after DVT, uh, with the expectation of reducing the rate of PTS, PTS um, reducing the rate of leg ulceration and improving quality of life scores um, and performing a cost effectiveness analysis. So all patients suffering from a DVT should um, receive anticoagulation as per standard of care, which is usually for a minimum of three months. And until 2015, um, stockings were recommended as part of standard of care by NICE. Um, previous studies evaluating the effectiveness of stockings in, PT in preventing PTS have been inconsistent due to poor adherence. Next slide, please. Um, so there is current controversy amongst clinicians nationally and internationally with both NICE and the American College of Chest Physicians recommending that stockings are not used um, to, in this patient population to prevent PTS. And the European guidelines, which were published in 2021, providing two high level recommendations that stockings should be considered in this patient population. Um, however, both sides of the debate acknowledge the need for further research in this area. Next slide. 
So the specific aim of CHAPS is to measure the difference in the incidence of PTS at a median of 18 months follow up after first acute DVT between the standard clinical care, which is anticoagulation um, and the intervention arm, which is the addition of the graduated compression stocking. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so graduated compression stockings um, contain elastic fibres which are designed to fit tightly around the legs and they fit tighter around the ankle with the le level of compression decreasing of the garment towards the knee. They must be worn smoothly on the skin without any folding um, and when they are used in patients with adequate arterial circulation they have no major side effects. Um, however, they can cause excess pressure on the skin if not worn properly, um, skin irritation, itching, um, redness or rashes. Next slide. So the primary outcome of CHAPS is any incident of the post syndrome, which is measured using the validated Valalta criteria over a median of 18 months follow up. Um, there are a number of secondary outcomes, including uh, venous ulceration, which again is measured by the Valalta criteria, any change in employment status from baseline, um, change in disease specific and generic quality of life and adherence to stockings and anticoagulants um, by patient self-report and there's also a cost effectiveness um, a cost effectiveness evaluation which will go on at the end of the study. Next slide. Um, so Screening should occur from the direct healthcare team who will signpost patients to the research team. Um, we have a number of ethical approved letters and posters to aid recruitment, and these can be um, provided to patients who are considering joining the trial. Next slide. So the inclusion criteria are symptomatic presentation of first DVT, which is um, less than, that should say three weeks as we changed our recruitment criteria. So less than or equal to three weeks from diagnosis. Um, any imaging confirmed lower limb DVT in any of those veins or in a combination of the veins. Um, patients able to give informed consent and anyone aged 18 or over. So our exclusion criteria, anyone with a life expectancy of less than two years anyone contraindicated to wearing stockings or previously intolerant of or already wearing them for more than a month, um, anyone with an ABPI of less than 0.8 or with absent pedal pulses, anyone with bilateral DVT, um, any previous chronic venous insufficiency as defined by the SEEP classification, um, pre-existing PTS um, including significant leg pain, um, or any other significant uh, related complications of PTS, any newly diagnosed cancer, metastatic cancer or cancer undergoing active treatment or palliation, um, and anyone contraindicated to anticoagulation or with a known allergy to the fabric in compression stockings. Um, so there are a number of baseline um, questionnaires that are completed with the patient and all the quality of life questionnaires should be completed prior to informing the patient of their treatment allocation to prevent bias. Next slide please. So patients are randomised electronically using the REDCap database. Um, they can only be randomised when all the inclusion and exclusion criteria are met and they're randomised one-to-one -one between the control arm and the intervention arm. Um, the type and the duration of the anticoagulation, again, is left to the discretion of the treating clinician. Next slide. Um, so the intervention um, is supplied by Medi UK, um, who provide a small consignment of stockings. So these are EU class two stockings, slightly higher compression than the um, TED socks that I spoke about in the GAPS talk. Um, research nurses will measure and fit the patients for stockings at baseline. Um, and patients should wear the stockings as soon as possible. Um, they must be worn on the DVT affected leg daily, applied on waking and removed on retiring to bed. Patients also receive a number of reminders to help them with compliance. So uh, research nurse face to face follow up visits as well as on the phone and a number of SMS reminders um, if they're happy to receive these. Next slide. 
Um, so some of the bigger criticisms of the other trials, so the SOX trial, for instance, um, informed the development of the CHAPS trial. So we've added some behavioural aids that should make it easier for patients in the event in the intervention arm to wear the stockings. So patients are shown a patient edu education video at baseline. Um, they're also trained in how to wear the stockings properly by the research nurse, and this can be reinforced in a number of follow-up um, follow appointments. Um, patients can receive a free donning aid um, if they're struggling to wear the stockings, and as I said, the SMS reminders. And there's also a forum where they can chat to um, other people on the trial regarding the best type of stockings and tips or tricks to use them. Next slide. So CHAPS also has an internal pilot study which will follow the first 200 patients, um, so 100 in each arm of the study for a year and will provide information on stocking use in both arms. So there's a vague criteria for um, follow-up for continuation of the study. So uh, if more than 70% of participants are wearing the stockings for uh, more than four days a week in the intervention arm, along with the documented reordering of the stockings in the past six months, um, then this is deemed to be a good level of compliance. Next slide. Um, so patients are followed up um, and data will be collected um, using many of the same questionnaires as were recorded at baseline um, at six and 12 months, and all patients will receive a final follow-up visit, which will average into a median of 18 months follow-up. Next slide, please. So CHAPS is a multi-centre randomised control trial. The recruitment target is 864 patients. Um, and as I said, patients followed up for between six to 30 months, depending on their date of randomisation. Next slide. Um, so at the time of writing, 2,052 participants were screened as ineligible to participate in the study. So common reasons being having a distal DVT, previous chronic venous, venous insufficiency and a refusal to consent. Um, and to date, 104 participants have been randomised. Um, we're quite behind, obviously, due to COVID. Um, we started just before the pandemic and during COVID, all sites were basically paused to recruitment. We have 24 sites open and recruiting to CHAPS, which is um, more than we originally planned. So in the original application, we uh, plan to complete the trial with 11 centres. Um, and we've got four further sites that have been approved by the HRA and are actively in setup. And we're also liaising with the primary care research network um, who might be able to assist with uh, delivery of the study in the community and signposting to secondary care. Next slide. So, so far our retention figures, so 11 of 141 participants have withdrawn from all aspects of the trial. Um, so this represents less than 10% loss to follow up, which is in line with our expectations. Um, you can see the, um, the figures for the number of patients who have completed follow up, who we've got completed data for at these time points. Um, but obviously the numbers are quite low at the moment as we've had such a delay in recruitment, um, but we're really focusing on obtaining robust data at 18 months um, to get our median primary follow up um, and we'll seek to gather missing data uh, for these participants. Next slide. So as you're aware, like I said, um, COVID has obviously represented the biggest challenge to this trial. Um, recruitment was paused across all sites for about 14 months. And although all sites have been reactivated, um, the delivery of research in the NHS is still is still impacted. Um, so in, still impacted by COVID um, sickness and staff shortages, which has disproportionately affected some of our sites. Um, so some of our strategies to overcome this were the setup of new um, centres. Um, we've also explored the addition of international sites um, across Europe and we've received some expressions of interest from um, sites who would like to take part. We've also um, listened to our research teams actively and tried to make changes to the study protocol to aid recruitment. Um, we do on-site monitoring and we're also exploring the use of patient identification centres. Next slide. So 
the NIHR approved um, recruitment beyond our original planned end date. Um, so we had a number of targets set by the NIHR. Um, so we were allowed to continue on this basis. Um, early on, we did anticipate uh, major capacity issues in the NHS. And so this is why we switched our stock in supplier from the NHS to Medi UK. Um, so far, four substantial amendments have been approved for this study, and we've had 26 non-substantial amendments which have been directed at improving recruitment. For instance, changing the inclusion window from um, two weeks from diagnosis to three weeks. Next slide. So the study organisation you can see here, so the sponsor being Imperial College London, um, the, the database is managed by the Edinburgh Clinical Trials Unit, and we have a trial management group and a trial steering committee, um, as well as a data monitoring committee. Next slide. So, um, yeah, we are basically looking to expand the study and add further recruiting sites. So if anyone in the audience is interested in taking part in this trial, um, then do feel free to get in touch with me for further information um, and we can look to um, setting up some new sites. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. We have some questions come in. Um, and if anybody is interested, which obviously in your last slide, um, is there, uh, they contact you, but would there be a great deal of work? What should they sort of um, envisage as to be with a workload or burden on them um, by long rolling? Yeah, so um, uh, we're probably looking for a few patients a month from each centre, but obviously if, if it's less or more than that, then we're um, happy to discuss with each site. Um, so the the main, the, it's not too burdensome if patients are randomised to the control arm, they would just um, come in as normal, have their have their scan at baseline um, and then just be randomized to the control group so they'd be followed up at six months um, 12 months and have a final follow-up visit and if they're randomized to receive stockings then um, again it isn't too uh, it's not too difficult because each site should have a batch of stockings that are supplied by Medi um, and Medi also provide training in how to um, measure for patients for stockings so patients should be able to by and large get their stockings um, then and there at the baseline visit um, patients who are outside of that range can get a, um, a more specialist made to measure stocking um, and that can be done through Medi UK as well. Okay, thank you. So a lot of it is sort of taken care of. There's a question here from the audience um, asking, obviously you had the exclusion criteria, but um, how far back would you go? So they're suggesting if a patient had had one DVT but back in 2007 and they're now therapeutic on warfarin, do they need to keep wearing compression stockings? And um, uh, or would this, would the, would the evidence you have so far exclude this or who should they talk to about this? So anyone with a previous DVT would be excluded from the study. But if they if it was a new DVT, um, acute and new acute proximal DVT and they were randomised to the intervention, then the protocol would recommend that they would wear stockings for the duration of the trial. And how however long they're on the trial is sort of determined when they're randomized into the study so the range is kind of between six months and and 30 months but patients will be asked to wear their stockings every day during waking hours for that period of time okay thank you and another question about inclusion really and they understand that patients with dvt and pregnancy have higher risk of developing pts so are pregnant participants included in this study yes they are they're not excluded yet Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sarah or Matthew, would you like to add anything? You've seen the questions as well uh, to the information about this. No, I think Rebecca's covered that all, unless Matthew has anything to add. Uh, no, I have, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, very much. Thanks. Sarah, I'd like to pass over to you now. Do you want to share your screen? Fab, let's give it a go. Okay, I'm just going to test. Is that moving across to the background screen now? So you should be able to see the first yeah. screen. And then, fantastic. Okay, I so say thank you very much to Thrombosis UK for the opportunity to present on the PET study, which is an NIHR HTA funded 
multi-center cluster randomized controlled trial evaluating the benefit of graduated compression stockings for the prevention of venous thromboembolism in low-risk surgical patients. And this is a study which, although is in setup, we hope to open to recruitment within the next couple of months. So we are very much looking for new sites to, to join us. So my name is Sarah Pierbucks and I'm currently managing the study. The chief investigator for the study is Professor Alan Davis, who is Professor of Vascular Surgery at Imperial College London. And we also have with us Matthew Machin, who is an academic clinical fellow, was heavily involved in drafting the grant application and is here to help answer any questions that you might have. So why are we conducting this study? Well, in terms of just a brief bit of background, so hospital acquired thrombosis, as you know, refers to any VTE related event within the 90 days of hospital admission, and it includes both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolisms. And hospital acquired thrombosis is associated with significant morbidity, mortality and associated costs. And in the UK alone, there are an estimated 32,000 fatalities per year with estimated annual direct and indirect costs equating to some £640 million. So the prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis is really important in reducing this morbidity, mortality and associated costs. Surgery is an established risk factor for VTE. However, very little is known about the rate of hospital acquired thrombosis in low risk surgical patients who undergo day case procedures or those who undergo a short inpatient stay. And graduated compression stockings such as TED stockings are designed for immobile patients at risk of VTE. And so they are routinely used in this cohort of low risk short stay surgical patients. However, the efficacy of these stockings have been called into question, uh, as we've just heard from Rebecca and as we'll see in just a moment. So what does NICE guidelines say? Well, the 2007 guidelines for the prevention of VTE previously recommended that all surgical patients should receive stockings to reduce their risk of VTE. But these guidelines were then superseded by the more recent 2018 guidelines which stated that all patients undergoing specific types of surgery detailed here, so including abdominal, thoracic, spinal, bariatric for example, should be treated with graduated compression stockings and to also consider their use in specific populations, so for all those undergoing cardiac, vascular and ear, nose and throat surgery. And so essentially taken together, the interpretation of these guidelines has meant that patients receiving a general anaesthetic uh, for a short case, so a day case or a short stay procedure of less than 48 hours are being provided with graduated compression stockings despite uh, being ambulant and discharged either on the same day or fairly early within that 48 hour period. So what do we know about the use of graduated compression stockings in this low risk short stay surgical cohort? Well, all the evidence for the use of graduated compression stockings in the prevention of VTE is fairly poor. So a recent systematic review led by uh, Matt and the team failed to identify any relevant randomized control trials, which included the specific patient group of interest in the PETS trial. As we've just heard from Rebecca, the GAP study also found that graduated compression stockings were of no additional benefit when combined with low molecular weight heparin. Um, for patients who underwent elective surgery and were assessed as being moderate to high risk of VTE. And finally, a recent Cochrane systematic review on the role of stockings for the prevention of DVT failed to include any studies which included uh, low risk procedures. So taken together, there is limited evidence on the use of graduated compression stockings in this group of interest, so this low risk short stay surgical group. And this is in the face of widespread use and also at considerable cost to the NHS. So all the evidence together points to the need for the PETS trial, where the main aim is to evaluate the benefit of graduated compression stockings for the prevention of VTE in patients who undergo short stay surgical procedures and who are assessed as being at low risk for developing VTE. So moving on to the study design now, so patients will be recruited from hospitals which offer day case and short stay surgical procedures. And this is a cluster randomized control trial, which means that randomization will be conducted at site level rather than at the traditional individual participant level. So 50 
trusts across the UK will be randomly assigned to either the intervention arm, whereby all patients within that site will be provided with graduated compression stockings when they undergo their procedure, or the control arm in which stockings will not be provided. And just to be clear here, any trust recruiting to pets would be expected to accept the site randomization allocation as per their standard of care. So there might be some cases where sites currently do not issue stockings and we'd be asking them to change their treatment to issue stockings and vice versa. So this is a fairly large trial and a total of 21,472 patients will be recruited over a total of 30 months. And the full eligibility criteria is detailed here. So individuals are eligible if they are between the ages of 18 to 59 years of age, if they're scheduled to undergo a, a surgical procedure of a hospital stay of less than 48 hours, and if they're assessed as being at low risk of developing BTE using the Department of Health's risk assessment tool, so if they score zero on that tool. And the full exclusion criteria is detailed here and patients are excluded for a number of reasons, including if they have a contraindication to wearing stockings, if they're assessed as being moderate or high risk of uh, VTE as per the Department of Health's risk assessment tool, if they require therapeutic anticoagulation, or if they require intermittent pneumatic compression therapy beyond theatre and recovery. So due to the nature of the cluster design, patients only need to consent uh, to be contacted for follow-up and consent can be obtained at any point prior to their first follow-up, which occurs seven days after their procedure. For the majority of patients, we envisage that consent will be obtained at the pre-assessment stage and to make things as easy as possible for sites, consent can be obtained either verbally uh, in written format or electronically via our electronic database, the REDCAP system. Participants will then be contacted at seven and 90 days post procedure to obtain that follow up data. And this data is uh, collected remotely, either via telephone or online survey. And uh, follow ups comprise of a few short questions, including self reported DVT outcome. So, does the patient think they've uh, has the patient been diagnosed with a DVT? or a pulmonary embolism within the past seven or 90 days. We're also assessing uh, generic quality of life using the short item EQ5D questionnaire. We will be assessing adverse events associated with the graduated compression stockings at seven days only for those in the stockings cluster. And at 90 days, we'll be collecting information on healthcare use. And this follow-up data, it's important to note, it will be conducted by the Coordinating Centre, so Imperial College London. And this is um, to hopefully reduce the burden on local research nurses and site staff, and really local site staff are only responsible, responsible for the screening and consenting of eligible participants. So all follow-up data will be collected centrally by the Coordinating Centre. The primary outcome is the rate of symptomatic VTE within 90 days and secondary outcomes are listed here and include mortality, quality of life, adverse events associated with the stockings and a cost effectiveness analysis. And here we have a diagram which hopefully quite nicely summarises the patient flow throughout the study. So in terms of timelines, this study is still in the setup stage, but we do hope to have ethical approval by next month, so by June, after which we will proceed with initial site setup and the recruitment of the first participants. The recruitment period is for a total of 30 months, but we have allowed for staggered site setup. So it will be the case that some sites are set up um, at a later date. In terms of targets, we would expect each site to recruit at least 430 patients. Um, but we, again, also expect that some of the larger centres would have higher targets or would agree higher targets with us. In terms of what sites will receive, so sites will, of course, receive full training on study procedures. Uh, in terms of financial remuneration, this comes to £28.20 for each eligible patient consented into the study and will also register the PET study for the NIHR Associate PI scheme. So we are very much looking for new sites. And if you are a principal investigator or research team uh, looking for more information or looking to take part in the study, then 
please do email us at the email address here, which is petstrial at imperial.ac.uk. Uh, and we're very happy to provide you with some more information um, either now or offline. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was very interesting. And I hope um, people attending now or um, if they share with their colleagues will con be in contact with you to uh, look at both of those trials and being involved. One of the things, and, and um, I'm not sure if, if um, you can signpost here, but we obviously need this evidence to show us about what's the best thing to do with compression stockings. And, with, and from the first trial, that's being gathered. But guidelines are still running behind a bit. I'm sure they will change as they come up and, and more evidence and, and practice is showing this. Do you have anyone that you can signpost to? Because what we hear is often from practitioners who have a barrier between evidence and then guideline. And how do they implement the new evidence when the guideline isn't quite there? Do you have any centres that you're associated with or clinicians that you can signpost them to to discuss how they're implementing it? I mean, that's a good question. I, I'm probably very biased and I would always refer people on to Professor Davies. Um, but Matt, being a clinician, I don't know whether you would have anything to add to that. Uh, yes, I suppose in terms of the, for example, the GAPS evidence, there's a, we wrote to NICE in 2021 to see if there was going to be an evidence review in light of the um, evidence from GAPS. And they said that the next uh, signpost evidence review for, for VTE is uh, 2024 that they would consider bringing it forward um, if needs be. Um, so I think the, the, the evidence review process is incredibly long um, and expensive. Um, so I think it does take some time. In terms of individual uh, clinicians or people to discuss with in terms of uh, specialists, I don't have anyone to, to name per se, but yeah, I suppose um, nothing further to add on that front. I suppose the, um, the, exempl the thrombosis exemplar centres are always good places to sign uh, signpost to um, and also I know from from gaps that um, Hampshire Hospital for instance in um, sorry Salisbury actually implemented uh, their kind of gaps um, S policy before before gaps even started so their center didn't use stockings in this patient population um, so they'd be a center to go to to ask how they uh, you know how they managed to get that set up at their local hospital um, if people were interested in in trying to adopt some evidence before guidelines were updated. That's really useful actually. And the VT exemplar state um, centres represent quite a variety of different types of centres as well. So, it, you know, it, it helps when you're looking, you can probably find somebody who's in a similar trust to your own to liaise with. So yeah, thank you. Um, with the recruitment, so is there a date for either of the trials when recruitment has to be secured? So for people getting in contact, urge them to do this sooner rather than later. For pets, I would urge sites to get in contact sooner rather than later. We are looking to recruit from, um, I said, at least 50 sites, but we don't envisage going beyond that. Um, but we would welcome any kind of um, questions at this stage. And as I said, we will be allowing for staggered site setup. So if a site does take a couple of months to think about it to assess feasibility, that's also fine. We probably will be setting up new sites um, towards the end of the year in, in the new year 2023 as well. Yeah, so there's the same for the same for chaps really. Um, so we we have 24 sites open, which is um, great, but it's good to add some more sites just to provide a bit of a buffer. Um, obviously, while the NHS is still kind of slowly getting back to normal, things do things are improving. But um, yeah, it's taking some sites a bit longer than others, and obviously other um, certain sites have their own individual issues or patient pathway problems. So yeah, it's good to get some extra sites on board to aid recruitment. But for this afternoon, thank you so much to Sarah, to Matthew and to Rebecca.